what was something as the season started to develop that was on my mind and on Sheila's mind. So as, as the season ended and I've been in touch with their representatives during the year, it became kind of a natural thing to do. Uh, they were a little off kilter because Dan had one more year than Brad and I wanted to get that aligned. So uh, we gave Brad two extra years, Dan one extra year and then revamped and re did their contracts for the last couple of years. So, and it provides continuity. And I think, uh, you know, the teams that have been successful year in and year out have a lot of continuity at the top. And I think that's the, the approach that we're going to pursue. Just get it out of the way with the yeah. camp talk situation. Is there anything you can share from an organizational perspective on how that situation is going to be? Sure. Well, we were learning at the same moment you guys were learning about the, the warrant and, Actually, I was on a Zoom call with the league on another matter when it popped up on my phone. And so as soon as that call wrapped up, uh, we kind of quickly convened to talk about it. Um, we were able to reach Cam and talked about it and suggested that he get counsel and you know do the right thing to turn himself in. Um, and then uh, after that, we met the rest of the day and then the following morning to decide to release him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mrs. Ford said that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it still is in place. I mean, there's obviously there's a legal matter here that will determine exactly what happened. Um, but it, I would say, you know, that was a factor as well as the fact that he was, you know, I guess not on the run from <laughs> from the warrant. So um, all that factored in. And it was a difficult decision, but uh, it was the right decision. And we're just, you know, moving on. Don't want to scoot into the yeah. topic, but just a lot of people have asked yeah so the first of all i want to make sure everybody knows that we didn't release him because of anything related to the cap or money that we may owe him it was the right thing to do for the organization um but we did release him with a post june one designation which will allow us to deal with a, whatever the cap implications are over two seasons versus one um, and we're going to let the process between us and him and the union play out to determine exactly what happens. But uh, money was not on my mind when we made the decision. We'll be uh, rolling them out probably just before the draft. And uh, I think everybody will be excited about it. I'm not going to tease it too much, but uh, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. It was a multi-year process that Brian and uh, Mike Disner really led and uh, worked with Nike in the league. And I think the fans are going to be really excited about it. That's a way to get me to say something about them. <laughs> they're not purple. They're not uh, yellow and gold. Like uh, they're, they're honoring our traditional colors with a little updating and twist. So, and it gives us a lot more options too. We're going to introduce a couple of different, uh, pan options that could go with jersey, so it'd give us different options to wear during the season. See. We had a number of them go through a photo shoot, and I think they all were very, very excited about it. We got a few players who really care about uniforms, and uh, those that do were very happy with what they saw. Uh, we're going to treat that in a little different way. So I'm not going to tease exactly how it is, but it's, uh, it's going to be honored, but not uh, in the same way it was on the current uniforms. Well, you know, the, the city's working more on it than I am, but uh, the city and the sports commission, the league, uh, the footprint, which you guys seen now has been out there. Uh, I do know the first day that people could register for it. We had almost 100,000 people sign up, uh, which is two and a half times what signed up the first day in Kansas City. So I think it's going to be a raucous downtown environment. Uh, encourage people to stay in tune with the traffic patterns and the footprint to make sure that if they don't get in the footprint because it's you know full. There's going to be other places downtown to watch the draft and hopefully cycle their way in. But uh, I think it's going to be dynamite for the city. Very excited. Um, very excited to see all those people downtown and get the whole world to see Detroit maybe in a different way than what they perceive right now. I think it's going to be a great three-day commercial for the city. Have you, have you made any progress on you know, the 
We're still evaluating. I know there's a lot of rumors out there, and I every time I talk about it, it leads to more people reaching out to me with ideas on where we should be. And um, so, it, it, I would say it's an early stage of evaluating it. We're we're focused on potentially that, obviously downtown with the 375 project and the impact that's going to have on the stadium and traffic flow. So we've got a real estate consultant who's working with on all those things, but you know, very very early stages of any announcement on the practice facility. We don't have to be only, you mean for the practice facility? No, 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 they're um, unrelated. Well, I, I understand, you know, the, the ticket increase was substantial for certainly, you know, lower bowl seats near the 50 yard line. But I think if people went back and looked at what they could have paid those seats for on the secondary market, and what our you know playoff games we're going for it's it's really where the market is and we've had 96 percent renewal rate so nobody's really abandoned their tickets uh, we still have i think it's approaching twenty thousand people on a wait list um, and we've been very cautious over the years recently in not increasing the prices and have really fallen quite a bit behind the league average and this barely catches us up to kind of just below league average so Mm -hmm. Well, they'll have they'll opt in if they want to, um, and if they don't opt in, we'll give them another chance to opt in later on. I think the opt in rate will be much higher than previous years, given what happened last year. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the stadium was electric, and I think you know the fans have as much to do with that as almost anything we do. But uh, it is interesting, you know. There's this uh, voice of the fan rating that you might have you know followed in years past, and we were number one in game day experience. That has a lot to do, I think, with the, the on the field performance, but also a lot of things that we do to make it exciting to be in the stadium. And I would say the two playoff games were environments like I've never experienced before, especially the uh, the Rams game when I think the stadium was full an hour before kickoff. And that just creates a whole different energy and experience. We've tried to take advantage of it with, you know, the different things with the wristbands and the other things that we did in the playoffs in particular. So very happy with it, but we'll always continue to try and improve it because, you know, there are choices. You don't have to come to the game. You can watch it on TV. But I think those that didn't get a chance to be there in person will want to be there in person because I think they saw something on TV that they wouldn't want to miss. Yeah. <laughs> There's a couple things I'm um, not ready to announce, but we're going to make a few tweaks, change a couple areas, um, a lot of concession opportunities to upgrade. Um, so we'll probably have more information on that in the spring. But there's there's a couple projects underway already. Steam, so. You uh, recently announced the practice of Calvin Johnson's mm -hmm. primitive, um, obviously with contentious and controversial for a long time with what's thought of the surgery from the CBA. Yep. Um, how much was this partnership kind of part of the package of bringing him back? I would say it was kind of an outgrowth of the relationship getting better. Um, and I would say Calvin's completely in the fold now. And he was at a lot of our games, as I'm sure you guys saw, and he was at the playoff games. And, you know, he was as excited and into it as anybody else uh, watching the game. So I'm glad it's worked out that way it has. And, you know, time has a way of fixing things. And uh, we've had a number of very good conversations. And, you know, Mike Disner's worked really closely with him and his team to, to bring him back. And, Primitive was just an outgrowth of that as opposed to a part of it. So. I uh, have never used that, but don't tell Kelvin that. <laughs> uh, the relationship with him? Primitive? Well, Primitive is only going to be for Ford Field events, so non-NFL events. So it didn't really require any league approval. I mean, if the league were to lo loosen up on what you can do with uh, that type of product, we would probably go back and reinvent the product or the partnership to include Lions games. But right now it's exclusively for like concerts and other things. So. No, yeah, no, no. Yeah, you... Well, we, uh, you know, we've kind of sat on the sidelines with this the last couple of years when the league opened it up, kind of wanted to watch what other teams were doing. And uh, 
learn from them. Canada obviously is a, a natural given the proximity. Uh, the only issue with with bidding on Canada was it uh, caused us to give up exclusive rights in Windsor. So right now another team could come into Windsor, which until this happened they couldn't. Um, I'm willing to defend our position in Windsor against other teams given the, the close proximity and the number of fans that we hand over there. Um, in Germany, you know, with the number of games that are being played there, and in particular with St. Brown's popularity, it's kind of a natural thing to draft off of his popularity and, and vice versa, because I know he wants to do some things over there. So um, so that's uh, the two that we bid on now. We may look at a few others in the future, but uh, we're excited to have been awarded because Germany is getting pretty full. I think there's up to 10 teams now that have rights there. And so we might have been one of the last teams to get an opportunity to, to be in Germany. It gives you an opportunity to go in there and work on partnerships, you know, use your marks in the country. Um, I think initially there'll be some investment that will not have a return for a few years. Um, we're probably going to hire a person or two to focus on this exclusively. Um, the NFL has offices in those countries, so you can you know, draft off of that a little bit. Um, but we've got some plans that uh, we have ready to go, but um, probably the revenues years down the road after we make some investments to, to get our popularity up there. I think now, you know, we're one of the teams that could probably benefit from this, given the popularity of the franchise, too. So it's another reason to do it now. Um, I don't know that it increases the possibility. Um, we're going to play one, I would assume, in the next year or two. We're kind of overdue. Um, I suppose we could still play one this year because Chicago and Minnesota are in London. We could be a road team. Um, but I think if we're in Germany, when we have to give up a home game, probably being in that market would increase our opportunity to have a game there. And the team is hard to the Cowboys fiasco for two in the state of the field. I'm just curious, what, what goes into that process when you lose, you know, Todd Cook Collins, you guys have been able to the Thank you. I didn't know where you were going with the cowboy fiasco, but <laughs> <laughs> I thought I missed something today with Jerry Jones or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of like how it affects the team, that's yes. how it's running the spotlight. So, what, what is the process of looking out there? And I guess, did you receive a resume from there? Um, I'll come back to that last part of the question. Okay. Um, so, you know, obviously the night of the, the call was you know, disappointing. And, you know, we believe we had done everything correctly. Um, people make mistakes, obviously. And I think once uh, the call had been made to declare that that Skip was eligible, inevitably, there was going to be a flag thrown. You, you can't change who was eligible because if it was, we were on defense, you would have been upset that they, you know, let 68 catch the pass when 70 was declared. So I understand people make mistakes and the flag was thrown. We thought we did everything correct. Um, in terms of the process, you're really not allowed to talk to the league until 9 a.m. the day following the game. So I sent a text to Troy Vincent and said, I'll be calling you at 9 a.m. You know what the topic is. And I called him at 9 a.m. He was in church. So he called me back at 10 uh, and I asked if he prayed for better officiating. <laughs> so what you said he always does. Um so I talked to Troy. I subsequently got on the phone with Troy and, and Walt Anderson, um, talked through it. I mean, there's a legitimate difference of opinion as to who said what and who heard what. Um, and so the resolution is really that, you know, you log your complaint and they promise to do better. And, you know, there's really nothing you can do to change it. But I didn't want Dan or anybody else to have to worry about it. I mean, that's, you know, they got another game to get ready for. It would have been nice to have uh, had a chance to see if we could win that game. The, the two point play didn't win the game. I mean, they still had 30 seconds. They had a timeout. They could have kicked the field goal, but it would have been nice to see if we could have stopped them because we might've been playing San Francisco and Detroit for the chance to go to the Super Bowl. We never really, we didn't really bring it up because we think we did it correctly. Yeah. Um, I don't know that there's anything that we could have done differently that would have, you know, caused the, you know, ref to recognize 68 versus 70. So it wasn't one that we talked about. There's a few others that we talked about that we didn't submit. Um, but the ones, you know, one pass this morning, we have a couple more that'll be discussed tomorrow. Um, so we, you know, it's, it's a different approach maybe than we've done in the past where we actually have, you know, people taking notes during the season of potential rule changes that we may want to bring up. 
And uh, I think we've got a, a process now that's yielded at least, you know, last year we got the quarterback, this year we got the third challenge. So um, all about improving the league and improving uh, things from our perspective for um, everybody, not just the Lions. Well, it's certainly something we, you know, are taking seriously. Um, and, you know, we, we did listen last year with the training staff. On top of that, we're now doubling the training room. I don't know if you guys have seen all the construction going on. So we're continuing to invest in that and we'll continue to invest in the food service too. We made a few changes this year. Uh, we're a little bit, you know, landlocked in terms of what we can do with the, the kitchen size and everything. So it's, it's going to cause us to be a little more creative, but uh, we made some improvement. We're not where we want to be because you don't want to be getting, you know, C's and B's on that. So we'll continue to look at it. But I mean, the investment in hiring the training staff, doubling the training room, you know, is, is proof that we're going to take it seriously. There's a balance there of expanding and upgrading the facility while you're weighing this, this decision. Is that something you just are constantly doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, you, you do have a 20 plus year old building that needs to be modernized and you don't want to continue to put a bunch of bad money in after uh, after good if you're going to relocate. But given where we are in the discussion about relocation, doing this doesn't really you know, change the decision. It just makes the players hopefully more healthy and we have more room for them so that uh, more of them are on the field next Sunday or next year on Sunday. Um, and that's you know something we need to do now, not wait three or four years for so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I didn't really have any specific requests. I thought they treated us pretty fairly last year. I would like to maybe still have a uh, mid-season buy, um, which was very helpful. Um, with the extra home game, I'm glad that you know we're not having to give that up internationally. So I had a lot of discussion about the potential of that before it was decided that we were not going to have to play an international game. Um, we, we have a good schedule, both road and away. I think there'll be a lot of primetime games, I would assume, given last season, and maybe even a few 425 games, which we've not had too many of those at home. So um, other than that, I'm just, you know, in conver conversations with them, and I think it'll be fair. They've been fair to us. I don't know if they're different. People... Certainly congratulate you when, as opposed to stay away from you, <laughs> you know, which is maybe a little different, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting feeling, uh, to, you know, have, you know, people congratulate you and say what excite, you know, they got watching the games and what a great team we have. And, but, you know, everybody's zero and zero now. So we got to start all over again. Teams have, um, and uh, agents have, and members of the press have. So, um, but I think you know it, it is a copycat league, and you know people tried to find the next Sean McVay, and maybe people are trying to find the next Dan Campbell. But you know, I, there's one Sean McVay and there's one Dan Campbell, so it's kind of hard to replicate special people like that. So, I, I think what I've told everybody is just do what's right for you, do what's authentic for your franchise, and figure out what you're looking for before you go start interviewing people. Um, I would say consciously I've spent a little more time on the football side because uh, I believe that was the way to jumpstart the whole organization. Um, and so it's evolved a little bit, but not that different than it was before. I think the, you know, the culture is very different, which is embraced by everybody. And I think largely led by the two of those guys. Um, and so the communication is better. I think the transparency is better. Um, and all that's a, a credit to those two. And, you know, when we were hiring them, you know, while it was a little different to talk about collaboration, um, we kind of eliminated people that we didn't think could collaborate. And other teams have really taken note of that because I think that's where you really start to have issues is when you don't have good collaboration and you have people looking out for what's right for them versus what's right for the organization. 
And that was another reason, I think, to give the contract extensions to them so they knew they have long-term security so we can keep doing things right and not have to wonder about, is my job on the line? So. Do I want to say? What do you think? <laughs> Chris has been great. You know, his, uh, his job is probably the hardest one to describe because he does a little bit of everything. <clears throat> but I think, you know, bringing him, you know, and you guys were there when we announced his hire. It was kind of like a two phone calls for me, a text message, and he had one call with Sheila and we hired him. But he's a lion through and through and has been great for the culture. He's kind of a confidant and advisor to a lot of people, including Dan and Brad and me and Sheila and and others, and you know, he just kind of is an ombudsman around the whole organization, sitting in draft meetings, sitting in coaching meetings, you know, on the field during practice, talking to the business side about what's going on, so that they're uh, up to speed and can talk to you know partners and ticket holders. So he, he's been great, and uh, I'm glad that he's going to stick around too. You guys are very personal questions. How much are you guys making, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> yep um you know i was very i mean it was very close this morning i ended up having to ask what the final vote was but i think we need another three or four votes probably um i think the alternative is not going to be liked by people because i think it might just lead to the eliminating the kickoff if we don't change the rules so um I think tomorrow morning there'll be more discussion about if we don't do this, what's the alternative? Um, we were in favor of it. I mean, we have a good special teams coach. We focus on special teams. I think it's an opportunity to scheme up something that you know, maybe could be an advantage. Um, I got the sense, though, and, and even the people that were against it, they were not against it because of the play. It was just, you know, the newness of it. Um, so we'll see what happens tomorrow morning. We talked about it for over an hour. I know that. So. Well, certainly, you know, I expected him to be a strong candidate and he had six teams reach out to him. So you expect, given the popularity of his name as a candidate, you know, our success and the fact that six teams were interested in talking to him, I, I thought it was unlikely he would be back. But the more I talked to Ben as he went through the process, I had a sense that maybe he wanted to be back. Um, and I don't think he's he's staying for any reason other than he likes what we're doing and there's unfinished business. I mean, you get that close. Um, I think he wanted to make another run at it. He's still very young. He's going to have head coaching opportunities down the road. Um, I think AG was probably um, more interested in, in pursuing the opportunities, but it just didn't work out for him either. I think it, it hurt both of them that they couldn't be interviewed in the championship week which is one of the things I've talked to the league about. There's some oddities and when, when you can and when you can't interview these guys. Um, you know, Ben, as an example, had six teams want to talk to him and you have to interview him that wildcard weekend or you can't talk to him until after the Super Bowl. So he couldn't even hardly fit in six interviews. And then in the leading up to the conference championship, you can't be interviewed for a head coaching position if you're playing in it. But there's this oddity that if somebody wants to interview one of your guys for a coordinator job, you have to make them available. So we had like Tanner was, you know, being requested. I think uh, others had, you know, some interest in coordinator positions. So there's this weirdness that they have to be allowed to interview, but a head coaching candidate can't. So I've made the league aware of my views on both those things. We'll see if they make any other changes. We did make one change this morning to the Rooney Rule to extend, you know, for two years this um, 72 hour cooling off period before you can interview somebody after their season's over. So they're always looking at things, but I think some of all those factors probably hurt them a little bit. Um, but I'm glad they're back too. So continuity at the, you know, continuity with Dan, Brad, AG, FIP, Ben, it's good for everybody. I know you're going to have a specific dollar each year, yeah. but you have financially committed to these decisions, making these jobs. Yep. Well, certainly willing to, you know, pay for good performance and, you know, you know what the market value is. There's good data out there from the league and, you know, 
um, what you have to be prepared to pay somebody to keep them if they're good at what they're doing. And that's what we've done the last couple of years. And, you know, if, if people don't perform, they probably aren't going to have that opportunity. Um, I do think it's also made the organization a desirable place to work. And, and Dan in particular is a coach that coaches want to coach for. Um, so well, you hear that from coaches that have joined us even this year, you know, what it just feels like a great place to be. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, I don't do that very often, but, you know, lots happened in the last 10 years. <laughs> so going from, you know, the transition, you know, into my role and then to moving on from Jim Caldwell and bringing in Bob and Matt and then going through the transition, you know, from Mrs. Ford to Sheila and then from Bob and Matt to Dan and Brad. Um, yeah, I think we're where we want to be as an organization. It took a couple of turns in the road to get here. Um, but I'm glad, you know, I think I've learned a lot. And I think, you know, Sheila and Mrs. Ford learned a lot by mistakes that we made as opposed to successes. And uh, I think you always learn more from things that go wrong. And you just have to be willing to learn from it and, and adapt and change. So um, I'm thrilled with where we are, but, you know, we didn't quite get to where we want to get to. And hopefully in the next year or two, we can get over that hump, too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you, it, you learn from experience. It's the best teacher. And I think, uh, you know, going through some things that didn't work out, you know, teaches you what you're more interested in making sure you do the next time. And I think the big thing was the big cultural shift, you know, and that uh, that pays off every which way, I mean, both in terms of the coaching staff, how the players react to the coaching staff, how the fans react to the team, how the rest of the organization reacts. And uh, we're in a really good spot right now.